first off, you'd think that the first way to punish bad behavior would be to stop encouraging it. But that's not exactly what's going on. Even after President Obama said last month that BP's recklessness had contributed to the disaster in the Gulf and promised that BP would pay for the damage, the Pentagon is still paying out hundreds of millions of dollars to BP for fuel for the military. According to a report in the Washington Post, July 5th, BP scored contracts worth close to a billion dollars this year. And last year, BP was the Pentagon's single largest fuel supplier. For all the talk of going green, we're not paying this kind of cold cash out to any single renewable fuel provider. Imagine if we did. That's just what Christian Parenti calls for in a forthcoming special energy issue of The Nation magazine. Christian Parenti, contributing editor at The Nation, joins me next. Uh, the tar balls are cleaned up. They're off the beach. We've been out today, and there are no more tar balls sighted today. If any citizens see any tar balls out there, please call the local Coast Guard station, Texas General Land Office, or the National Response Center. Well, that's the latest on the oil disaster, oil bulls throw, coming up on the coast of Texas. The world's worst, certainly the country's worst ecological disaster caused by recklessness by PB, and yet the money to BP keeps flowing. Our money, taxpayer money. Christian, you read the same story I did in the Washington Post. I bet you were as outraged. Yeah, it's, uh, it's outrageous that, the B that BP got almost a billion dollars in government contracts. Um, it's also outrageous how well they've managed the, the appearances of this bill. The fact that we're even discussing tar balls when, in fact, there are huge underwater plumes. BP is using this dispersant, which is illegal in Europe, to, to hide the oil, keeping scientists away. The whole thing from start to finish is, is horrible. So. This energy issue has a number of pieces in it. The one I worked on looked at government procurement. Um, recently, Bill Gates was on Capitol Hill asking for more government subsidies for R&D. He wanted to increase what is now about $5 billion to $16 billion worth uh, for, for, for research because he wants to see breakthrough innovation, which is important. But actually, if we're going to move away from fossil fuels, we have most of the technology. And what we need to do is ramp it up. In, Clean tech developers and business people talk about the uh, valley of death, which is the period in a technology's lifestyle, um, uh, life um, span between the moment of innovation and when it becomes competitive on an open market. And there's this dearth of capital to not invent it, but to ramp it up, to make it reasonable so the average consumer, the average business will whatever. And that's where we're power. at, because you right. hear from a lot of not, you know, alternative fuel providers and alternative energy folks who say, we've got the technology, we've built the oil, the, the, the solar cells, we've figured out the electric mm -hmm. car. It's just too expensive on the market. It can't compete. But what can government do about that? We're told to leave it to the market. Right. So instead of, because the, the U.S. energy economy is a two to three trillion dollar a year economy. So we need way beyond $16 billion worth of act activity around this. Luckily, the government in the U.S., state, federal, and local, constitutes about 38% of GDP. A lot of that's the military. But what that means is that the government has tremendous purchasing power. The U.S. government is the largest consumer of energy in the world. It has the largest vehicle fleet in the world. So if the post office moves to electric vehicles, that would help bring down the cost of producing electric vehicles. It would help bring down the cost of producing charging stations. And then when the average consumer was debating whether or not they would buy an electric car versus uh, a regular car, there wouldn't be this issue of an electric car being more expensive. And there's a complicated thing of maybe you get a tax credit, maybe not. It would just be like the same price. Mm. Give us the example that you talk about in your article. And it's a great piece in The Nation magazine, The Big Green Buy. Um, you talk about a single company, Smith Electric? Smith Electronic. I mean, Smith Electric Vehicles, which is a... a the U.S. arm of a British company that's been making electric trucks for 80 years. So Smith Electric Vehicles has a plant in Kansas City, and they have plans to open 20 plants around the country where they buy chassis and wire harnesses and wheels from the auto industry supply chain at large, and they put electric motors in these to create delivery trucks, refrigerated trucks, whatever. So they're turning out about 20 vehicles a month. If the military or the post office or the government services agency, which is like the federal government's janitor, essentially, started buying electric vehicles, 
Smith Electric would have lots and lots of orders. So instead, what they're dealing with is they got a $32 million grant from the Department of Energy, and they're very happy about this. They're doing these little test projects here and there and there. But when you look at the fact that the federal government is the single largest purchaser of vehicles, all of these other programs seem Lilliputian in comparison. Why doesn't the federal government just buy electric vehicles? Why doesn't the post office, which has 150,000 vehicles, the vast majority of which don't travel more than 20 miles a day, are parked in the same spot every night, they're perfect for electrification. Why don't they just you know, begin electrifying and that fleet? With, with the massive scale, it's like bulk purchases of pharmaceuticals, comes down lower prices. Mm -hmm. Economies of scale would be achieved. The, the head of Smith Electronics told me, he said, if we could buy gearboxes in batches of 100 rather than 10, we think we could have the costs of those components cut by 30 to 40 percent. So why isn't the government doing that? And what happened last October? I thought that Obama well, had signed something that was basically encouraging states and cities to do that. And then I want to come to what is the government doing by continuing to feed the more of BP? Well, luckily, yeah. In October, Obama signed an executive order telling all federal agencies to purchase green and to come up with plans to reduce their consumption of energy and achieve savings in that way, which will help them if there's a premium on buying green, if they can you know, balance that out. So what's happening now is agencies are devising these plans. The core agency is the government services uh, agency, um, or the general services agency. Um, and one of the problems so far is that the culture in a lot of these government agencies is just, they're just out of touch. They don't really uh, take this seriously. Uh, so it's taking some time to ramp up. And there's been a series of these since the Clinton era. George Bush even had one of these. But there's never been specific goals. And the one uh, that Obama signed, the executive order Obama signed in October, included a goal of cutting emissions f by federal agencies by 28%. Uh, I forget the, in, in however many years, and a couple other really concrete mm. um, goals. So there is some good news. There, the government is moving in that direction. Jose Serrano has proposed a bill that would have the post office buy 15% of its vehicles electric. There's a couple other bills, but they're not part of the real push around energy led by Ed Markey and, and, and these other people like uh, Lieberman. Before we let you go, I want you to talk for a second about Afghanistan, and I really urge people to check out the special energy issue because everything that, that, uh, that Christian's writing about there, I think it's what we talk about here is like, can't government use its actual power? We've become so alienated from government's power that we forget the power of the purse, mm -hmm. not to mention what would happen if we calculated the price of these kinds of cleanups into the price of fossil fuels. It's all an right. energy issue. But quickly, I wanted you to listen to this clip from Fareed Zakaria this weekend, uh, talking about the U.S. deployment in Afghanistan in very stark terms. Take a listen. The number of al-Qaeda is, is actually relatively small. I think uh, at most we're looking at maybe 50 to 100, maybe less. It's in that vicinity. So if al-Qaeda is down to 100 men there at the most, why are we fighting a major war? Now, last month alone, there were more than 100 NATO troops killed in Afghanistan. That's more than one allied death for each living al-Qaeda member in the country in just one month. I just wanted to get your take on that. You've reported from Afghanistan. This is important stuff you're saying. Well, I, I think that uh, it's, yeah, the, the Afghanistan war is a total debacle. It can't be won. Uh, but I think that Obama is hostage to a real or perceived weakness uh, on his right flank with the electorate. And there was an analysis in The Independent that said that the, the core of the problem with McChrystal, there had been these ongoing problems between Obama and McChrystal, was that McChrystal had given a very bleak assessment to NATO generals, allied generals, and what Obama wants is good news so we can start moving to this terrorism plus strategy withdrawing that Fareed Zakaria sort of was hinting at there. Well, that's all we've got time for in this segment. I'm so sorry, Christian. We'll put a link to your article at grittv.org.